when you see idolatry, when you see lust and sin, when you see music that's all about violence and glorifying Satan, and you see people loving that music, it's easy to get discouraged. But remember, the Bible said this is exactly what would happen before Jesus returns. It said the world would become godless and people would then hate God and will even one day worship the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. So everything we're seeing in our world, the evil, don't be surprised by it. The Bible said it would happen. But you know what else the Bible said? It says that before Jesus returns, every nation would hear that he's going to return. And that's exactly why you're hearing this message right now. Jesus is coming back. And those on his side will rise. Those on the other side, well. Godlessness is clearly growing. No one can deny that. And sometimes, as we see in scripture, when wickedness grows, God is known for raising up those like Elijah to call it out. So, let's talk about Elijah. Around 870 BC, in the book of 1st and 2nd Kings, we hear about the prophet Elijah. And this was no ordinary prophet. The power of God rested upon him. When the kings of Israel disobeyed God, Elijah would come onto the scene and whip them into shame. When King Ahab committed idolatry, Elijah was given power to stop the rain and cause drought. Elijah was also given power to heal. There was once a woman whose son had died, and Elijah prayed over the child, and the child came back to life. At one point, Elijah was sitting on a hill, and uh, 50 troops came to him. Elijah called down fire from the sky and burned them all up. And then another group of 50 came to him. He called down fire from the sky again and burned them up. Elijah had an interesting type of anointing. This is why many refer to him as a warrior prophet. Some prophets just deliver a message. But Elijah, on the other hand, delivered a message as well as the wrath of God. Now, why is this significant? Well, the book of Revelation says that the witnesses of God will call down fire from heaven in the end times. And it says the witnesses will stop the rain. And so many theologians argue that the same type of prophetic anointing and power that was on Elijah seems to be the same type of prophetic anointing that will be upon the witnesses. You see, anointings can be transferred. Okay, let's look at something. So, Elijah was a prophet of God who had an extreme anointing of power. Now, Elijah had a devoted follower named Elisha, okay? And in 2 Kings, Elijah and Elisha were walking along a road. And as they were walking, Elijah turned to Elisha and told him that the time for him to go to heaven had come. And, Eli and Elisha was devastated. You know, he loved Elijah. He didn't want Elijah to leave. And Elijah basically let him know that he wasn't about to die, but God was going to come and take him into heaven while he was alive. Like we, this is not something that normally happens. And so before Elijah was taken to heaven, he took off his coat, his mantle, and he struck the water with it. When he struck the water, <laughs> it parted from one side to the other. And then both Elijah and Elisha walked to the other side of the land. I'll never be able to do what you do. You will, Elisha. And after that, Elijah turned to Elisha lets him know that he's about to go to heaven. And before he goes to heaven, he says, Alicia, I'm going to give you one final request to ask of me before I go. 
And so look at how the conversation goes in Second uh, Kings 2, 9. Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And so here in this moment is Elisha's big chance to ask for anything from prophet Elijah before he goes to heaven. Like whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Just ask. So let's see what Elisha asks for. <laughs> and so Elisha says, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. Wow. Elisha could have asked for anything, but he says, Elijah, whatever is on you, whatever type of anointing is on you, please let me have it and a double portion of it because I want that type of power. He makes this request, right? He wants a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And after he makes that request, then out of nowhere, just a chariot of fire comes. A whirlwind picks Elijah up and he's carried to heaven. And you can just picture Elisha looking up like, well, I guess that's it. My master's, my friend is gone. My master's gone. But as Elisha's looking up, he notices that Elijah left something behind. You see, as Elijah was ascending to heaven, he left behind his coat. <laughs> so Elisha picks up the coat. Now, remember, Elisha has no power, right? He's a follower of Elijah, but he has no power. He's not really known as a powerful person at this point. <laughs> But he sees that Elijah left behind this coat, this mantle. So Elisha, he picks it up. And when he picks it up, he it's like he's thinking, OK, let me just try something here. Because remember, Elijah had hit the water with the coat and then the water parted from one side to the other. And they walked both walked through. So Elisha grabs the coat and it's like he's saying, OK, let me let me try something here. So Elisha then hits the water with the coat. And just as Elijah did, the water parted and everybody saw it. Jaws dropped. And when people saw this, this is what they said in 2 Kings 2.15. The spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. Elijah left behind his coat. And when Elisha got the coat, his mantle, he was clothed in the spirit of Elijah. Now, <laughs> this is this is pretty cool. So Elijah goes to heaven. He leaves behind his coat. Elisha picks it up. Now he has the spirit of Elijah. But remember, the spirit of Elijah is not just any type of anointing. No, the spirit of Elijah is a warrior for God anointing. OK, <laughs> so if you get if you have that type of anointing that comes upon you, mm, that's that's kind of a big thing. So let's look at what Elisha did after he was clothed with this type of anointing. So in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, shortly after Elisha received this empowerment, he immediately just started operating in the gift of healing. Verse 22 says that um, Elisha spoke to the land and he spoke to the water and um, he healed it so that it became fruitful. So he immediately had some type of power with that. And then as he continued to walk along this road, um, something interesting happened as he was walking. Uh, take a look at this, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. So from there, Elisha went up to Bethel. And as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. They said, get out of here, Baldy. Get out of here, Baldy. And then he turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. Um, let's look at this. Let's kind of talk about this here. Okay, so Elisha, he's walking on this road. Some boys come out of this town. I guess they don't like bald guys. Hey, they're making fun of him because he has a bald head, okay? And they said, get out of here, baldy. He didn't like that. He knows that he has the spirit of Elijah on him. He calls a curse on him. Two bears come out. The boys get torn up. I don't know if they died. I don't know. But there's two things we can learn from this. 
Number one, uh, clearly Alicia was bald and he didn't want to be made fun of about that. He, he wasn't having it that day. <laughs> OK, number two, Alicia had the power to not only heal and prophesy, but he had the power to punish. The point is this. When someone is operating in the spirit of Elijah, don't make them mad. That's a warrior spirit. You don't want to mess with someone who is operating in that type of anointing. Elijah, remember, Elijah called down fire from heaven to destroy 50 soldiers, and then he did it again. Elisha had bears come out of the woods. The spirit of Elijah anointing, it doesn't, it doesn't play. The question is, is there any indication that the anointing or spirit of Elijah can still cover people today? Well, let's look at what Malachi says. In Malachi chapter four, it says that before Jesus returns, or really before the Lord comes, Elijah would return. Look what it says, verse five. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And so this is why many people, even in Jesus's day, they knew about this verse. They knew that Elijah was supposed to come on earth again before Jesus was here. And so when they saw Jesus walking around, people would come up to him and say, you know, Jesus, you're here. So where's Elijah? We know Elijah, he's supposed to come before you, before the Lord shows up. So where's Elijah? We know, we see you, where's he? And look at what Jesus responded to them in Matthew 17, 12. He says, but I tell you, Elijah has already come and they didn't recognize him, but have done to him everything they wish. And in the next verse, it says, then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Wow. Jesus told them, Elijah, he already came. He came, but not physically, but spiritually through John the Baptist. <laughs> and this is why when John the Baptist was about to be born, look at what an angel said to his parents, Luke 1 17. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. <laughs> okay, this, this is deep. And, and, and I gotta make this clear. I gotta make this clear. So, cause this kind of was talked about in one of the uh, two witnesses documentaries and people have then asked, okay, so was John the Baptist a reincarnation of Elijah? No, I don't think this is saying anything like that. This is talking about something else. You see, John the Baptist was a person just like Elisha who operated in the spirit of Elijah, in the anointing of Elijah. You see, even though Elijah went to heaven, when he dropped his coat, what happened? Elisha picked it up and then that same spirit, that same anointing that was on Elijah was transferred to Elisha. So just like how Elijah was still in heaven while Elisha had power, Elijah was still in heaven when John the Baptist had power because John the Baptist also, according to Luke 117 and Jesus, was operating in the same type of spirit and anointing, the same mantle of Elijah. Why? Why did, why did John the Baptist have to operate in that type of anointing? To fulfill prophecy. You see, when the Bible makes a statement, it has to be fulfilled and God will see to it that it is fulfilled. Because in Malachi chapter four, verse five, it clearly says that before the Lord comes, Elijah must come first. And so to satisfy that prophecy, the spirit of Elijah had to come. It had to rest upon a messenger to prepare people for the Lord. Now, John the Baptist operated in the spirit of Elijah for Jesus' first coming. 
But we know Jesus is coming again. And the great and dreadful day of the Lord is still to come. And so to satisfy that prophecy, we know that it is likely that the spirit of Elijah must come again. Because as the prophecy in Malachi says, whenever the Lord comes, the spirit of Elijah must first come to do what? Prepare the way. And this is why before Jesus returns for the final time, it says the two witnesses will do what? Stop the rain, cause fire to fall, create plagues. Why? To prepare people for the coming of the Lord. The spirit of Elijah is coming back. Some people say that um, perhaps Elijah himself will physically return and do all of these things as one of the witnesses. And hey, and if you share that view, great, you know, share more of your perspective in the comments. That's what we're doing. We, we learn from each other. Now, personally, I think you can gather from some of our previous content that I lean towards those theologians who believe that there's some symbolism there and that the spirit of Elijah can satisfy this. Because um, even if Elijah didn't physically come when Jesus was here the first time, his spirit was upon John the Baptist. And apparently that satisfied the prophecy enough for Jesus to say that Elijah was already here. So if that was the case, then I don't think it's too far fetched to say that it's likely that the spirit of Elijah, the anointing of Elijah can again come and rest upon the witnesses of God, which will still, I would say, satisfied the prophecy of Elijah coming before the Lord comes, the spirit, the anointing, the mantle of Elijah. John calls them lampstands, which is one of his clear symbols for the churches. So this vision is more likely about the prophetic role of Jesus' followers, who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah, who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah. And this is why, you know, just as it says that the witnesses will go to war with the Antichrist, it says the saints will war against the Antichrist. Just as the witnesses will have power, the prophet Daniel said the saints will have power to resist the Antichrist. And so it seems that the same type of power described as taking hold of the witnesses is the same type of power that will take hold of the saints in the end times. And if that is the case, then that means that some of you, if you happen to be here during the final days, some of you hearing this may operate in the power anointing of Prophet Elijah as it is described with the witnesses. Now, if you lean this way, okay, if you, if you kind of lean this way in your interpretation, I think it is important to say that no, no, not all believers would operate in this type of power. This is this is big. OK, this is huge. It is a huge thing to operate in the anointing of Elijah. You saw what type of things he was able to do. So not all believers would operate in that type of power. And I think the biggest evidence of that is how Revelation 11, 4 says that the two witnesses are the two lampstands. Many theologians speak on how the entire body of Christ is represented by seven lampstands. And we see that in Revelation chapter one through three. But here it says that the two witnesses, those operating in this type of anointing are only two lampstands. So again, I don't want to spoil it here. Definitely when you get a chance, watch the two witnesses movie part two, because we look at how, yes, there are seven lampstands mentioned in the book of Revelation and they are interpreted by the angel as being churches. But two out of those seven were not rebuked. Two out of those seven were commended by God. And you're gonna to wanna to see the documentary to see which two out of the seven churches will be empowered and how that relates to us today. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Go watch that documentary. That's a big thing there. So there is something else that must be said about the spirit of Elijah. 
And so when you look at the way the spirit of Elijah operated throughout the Bible, it seems to operate in a type of plague power for a three and a half year period. For instance, Elijah stopped the rain for three and a half years. First Kings 17, Luke 425. This is likely why it is said that if you look at the chronology of John the Baptist's ministry, scholars point out that it is likely that he was in the wilderness prophesying for guess how many years? Three and a half years. If he had the spirit of Elijah on him, there's a time period with that. He was prophesying for three and a half years. Um, for some reason, he didn't really, he wasn't known for doing plagues and all that sort of thing. Maybe because that just wasn't his assignment, right? But it still seems that he operated for three and a half years of prophesying. And as you would expect, it says that when the witnesses are given power from God, they will prophesy for what? Three and a half years. The time frame of the Elijah anointing. And they will be given this power to boldly confront the forces of evil. So there it is. And amazingly, there is an incredible parallel between the two witnesses and Elijah and Elisha. And they will prophesy for what? 1260 days. 1260 days is 42 months. Interestingly, when you go back to here, how many of the boys were roughed up? 42. And how many bears came out of the woods to attack them for mocking them? Two bears. And so it is interesting because some have said that this may be a parallel of how the witnesses will have power the witnesses of God. And, I, and I'm just going to leave it at that because there are many interpretations with that. And you can look at some of our videos for where we lean on it. But whatever your perspective is on regarding who the witnesses are, we know they will have the power of God on them. We know that the world will mock them and not listen to them like this. These kids here are mocking these prophets. Right. And how many boys? Forty two. We know that during the time of the two witnesses, there will be a period of 42 months. And just as two bears came out and attacked them for mocking the prophets of God, we know that the two witnesses will attack for 42 months. So you see how these numbers, these design patterns, I, it's symbolic. And it just lets you know that when you listen to the numbers and when you see the numbers in scripture, it's something to pay attention to. Now, we know that the spirit of Elijah has the ability to create plagues. Okay. And we know that the witnesses of God will create plagues. And there seems to be many links between the power that the witnesses will have and the power that the end time saints will have. In the recent documentary, we looked at how it is likely that the prayers of the saints will have something to do with the plagues that will come. Is there anything in the book of Revelation that shows that the plagues that will come were created by the prayers of the saints? Well, let's read Revelation 8, 6. Now, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. And so, you know, you can keep reading and you will see that as each angel blows a trumpet, some type of plague takes place. So what was it that caused the angels to do this? Well, when we scroll up to verse two, it tells us what happened 
right before the angels started blowing those trumpets and causing plagues. Look at how it reads. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And after that, then we see the angels started blowing those trumpets. My friends, the main ingredient that caused these things to happen was what? The prayers of the saints. Prayers are powerful. When you get a group of believers praying about something, things happen. We got to understand the power of prayer. The thing that caused the angels to even do this, to create these plagues, was the, the prayers of the saints. That was the key ingredient that was presented before God. Because when you have enough people praying, it sends up an aroma to God that causes even angels to act. And so friends, get ready. Because just like Elisha picked up Elijah's coat and operating his anointing, I believe many of you will do the same. God has that mantle, but I believe he is ready to clothe his people, his faithful followers, who are like the two lampstands in the coat of Elijah. The anointing of Elijah is making a return, and the prayers of the saints will do mighty things.